Hi there and welcome from Ventura, California to today's webinar, UAS in the NAS, What's Next? Sponsored by Trimble and Inside GNSS and hosted by WebAttract, the leader in thought leadership webinars. I'm Lori Dearman, Senior Webinar Producer with WebAttract, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. And in just a moment, we'll be introducing our panel of thought leaders as today's webinar is about hearing from these experts as they discuss next steps around unmanned aircraft systems in the National Airspace System, also known as UAS in the NAS. You'll have an opportunity to have your questions answered at midpoint and at the end of the presentation during the Ask the Expert panel session. Now, we've invited you along with a diverse audience of over 400 pro professionals registered from 50 countries and 33 states and provinces representing a variety of industries. And over the next 90 minutes, regardless of your industry segment or your location, we're confident that you'll find today's webinar of value. Before we get started, Glenn Gibbons, editor and publisher at Inside GNSS, would like to take just a moment to welcome you. Over to you, Glenn. Thank you, Lori. On behalf of Inside GNSS and Trimble, I want to welcome our international audience of viewers to what I believe will be a very remarkable and authoritative web seminar. The U.S. Federal Admin Aviation Administration is currently engaged in a unique enterprise, Integrating Unmanned Aircraft Systems, or UAS, into the national airspace system. And they are just in time because a profound phenomenon is emerging in the global marketplace, the rise of autonomous systems capable of supporting a rich variety of applications. Applications in precision agriculture, in environmental monitoring, customized geolocation-based delivery of cargo, search and rescue, and in many more areas. At the heart of most of these unmanned aircraft systems are GNSS and inertial technologies that provide guidance, navigation, and control. But many other sensor technology are technologies are catching a ride on UAS to carry out these applications. These new autonomous systems will need to be able to share the national airspace with long-established, closely regulated manned aviation operations. The United States is not alone in this endeavor. The questions faced by the FAA and the UAS test site organizations that the agency has chosen to help answer them are being closely watched by governments and commercial ventures around the world. So thank you all for joining us today, and I hope you find the presentations to follow an informative and useful experience. Now let me turn the program back over to our moderator, Lori Dearman. Well, thank you, Glenn, for setting the stage. And uh, folks, we're going to get started with our very first poll question. We'd like to hear from each of you. Uh, what is your biggest concern around UAS? Uh, in this case, we'd like you to pick just one. Is it safety, public acceptance, standards, privacy, or, or maybe something else? All right. Looks like uh, safety came in at uh, number one, 41%. We've got public acceptance at 17%. Standards, 26%, privacy, 8%, and uh, some of you are citing other at 8%. So uh, thank you for that input. I know it will be helpful for our presenters as they go through their content uh, in the remainder of the program. And speaking of our presenters, I would like to go ahead and introduce our first presenter for today, uh, Charles Johnson. Chuck Johnson, and uh, first a few words in the way of an introduction. Chuck is NASA's Senior Advisor for Unmanned and Autonomous Systems for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, when he's, where he's responsible for developing uh, for the overall strategy for all unmanned systems from remotely piloted to full autonomous. Prior to this position, from 2010 to 2013, Johnson was the project manager for the unmanned aircraft system in the National Airspace System project. There he was responsible for execution of a $160 million technology development project to reduce technical barriers related to safety and operational challenges associated with enabling routine UAS access to the NAS. Johnson began his aviation career at the Federal Aviation Administration in 1982. He earned his bachelor's, uh, his BA degree in psychology from the University of Colorado and an MBA from San Diego State University. Chuck, it's fantastic to have you here. Welcome, and how are you? 
Excellent, Lori. Uh, thanks for the uh, introduction, and uh, thanks to Inside G GNSS um, and uh, the good folks at uh, WebAttract for putting this all together. Really appreciate it. So uh, today, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, the aforementioned project, UAS integration and the NAS project um, under NASA, um, and what we're trying to do in terms of future uh, autonomy research. Um, so. I want to start kind of with the problem statement um, and, and why UAS are uh, unable to access the NAS today. Um, it, it would seem to, uh, to many folks like they're just another airplane, why, why is there such a complication? Um, <clears throat> so right now there's a lot of different things that, that have to be solved in terms of technical challenges um, that have to be overcome, uh, automated separation assurance integration with collision avoidance systems. Um, robust communications technologies, robust human systems integration, and then the standardized safety and certification, and, and those were mentioned uh, in the poll that you just took as being pretty pretty important uh, to the overall community, uh, whether it's safety or, or standards. Um, and part of the problem right now is that there exist very few regulations specifically addressing unmanned systems. Um, aviation regulations are, are built upon uh, the condition of having a pilot um, actually in the cockpit in the aircraft. So when you think about things like um, separation assurance, collision avoidance, um, it, in today's system all those regulations are based on having uh, a pilot with eyes uh, in the cockpit able to look out and, and remain uh, an appropriate distance from other aircraft um, and then in a last minute maneuver uh, avoid other aircraft. And in terms of communication systems, um, you've got basically uh, voice communication where there's a human on the other end that can decipher whether or not there's been an inappropriate message sent. Um, and for unmanned systems, uh, much of it will be data link. Um, and as a result of that, there's, there could be uh, the potential of, of spoofing a system. So, um, so what we're trying to do is we're looking at how we um, develop um, and ultimately validate um, the, uh, the, the information that the body of evidence that's required um, to have safe uh, and secure U.S. access to the national airspace. Um, so so <clears throat> our job has been um, to look at it from that perspective at NASA. And, and when we uh, developed the U.S. and the NASA project, um, we wanted to make sure that um, even though we as a public agency, we have a, an interest in unmanned systems for uh, primarily for the purposes of, of science missions, um, we recognize that there's also an emerging need uh, to enable commercial applications. And we at NASA, of all the government agencies, you know, the FAA is the regulator, DOD, DHS, they have their own specific uh, missions for national um, security and defense. Um, we at NASA are very interested in enabling uh, commercial type op applications. So we have the, the capabilities to do that. We looked at the national need for all the things that, that had to be done in order to get access, unencumbered access to the national airspace. Um, and we looked at what our specific capabilities were and we came up with this particular project to align um, those, those things that we do at NASA that we do uniquely or at least best um, in order to uh, uh, come up with research findings to reduce or eliminate technical barriers for U.S. access. So we looked at command and control communication, um, human systems integration, some form of detect and avoid, separation assurance, sense and avoid interoperability, not just to detect and avoid, but how it interoperates with the rest of the system, looked at certification uh, and safety, and then one of the big keys that we have is that all of that information that we're trying to develop um, that would go ultimately to either the community of interest through RTCA or back to the FAA. We want to make sure that it's validated through uh, a relevant test environment with integrated testing. Um, and so that's one of the big keys that, uh, that we at NASA bring to the table. When we went through the formulation for this, there are clearly a lot of key stakeholders throughout the world for UAS. It's a very uh, uh, important and emerging uh, area of, of interest. Um, and so there are a number of different groups that are out there working the problem, some that have been around for many, many years, um, and some that are a little newer. And so we wanted to make sure that we looked at um, what uh, stakeholders influence 
where the community of interest is going in the future. Um, so within NASA, we, we have uh, things like uh, the NASA Advisory Council, and there's an aeronautics committee under that, um, and there was a U.S. subcommittee that was developed under that to look at some of the things that we were doing specifically on the project. The FAA has uh, their next-gen organization. They have a number of different organizations within uh, the agency looking at, at either the operational side as the air, air uh, navigation service provider or uh, from the regulatory side. Um, we have some government organizations like the uh, Executive Committee for U.S. Uh, Access. Um, <clears throat> we've looked at all sorts of different uh, communities of interest, including industry, RTCA, um, looking at the, internationally at the World Radio Conference, at ICAO. So all of those uh, communities of, of interest came together um, to solve some of the various problems, and so we are working uh, diligently with as many of those as we can um, to make sure that we're doing the right thing within our project. Also, uh, within the FAA, they have very specific uh, interest areas, and they have uh, organizations that are involved in helping them um, kind of decide what the next steps are. So the RTCA, Special Committee 228, um, which right now is chartered to develop minimum operational performance standards for detect and avoid and for command and control communications. Um, that U.S. Executive Committee that I mentioned, which are senior government um, officials that uh, are trying to figure out how the agencies, particularly FAA, DOD, NASA, and DHS can work together to solve these problems. The U.S. Uh, Advisory Rulemaking Committee, uh, which is really uh, co-led by industry and the FAA, um, to bring in the industry side of it the Sense and Avoid Research Panel under the OSD, which looks at gaps and how we address them. Um, uh, the international forums, uh, specifically uh, ICAO and uh, the International Telecommunication Union, where we're looking at uh, things to, that, that, that have to do with international standards. Um, and then looking at the, uh, the FAA's next-gen organization and how we actually enable these uh, uh, access uh, capabilities, not just in today's national airspace, but in the next gen. Um, so when, when we at the project, and, and again, our perspective is, uh, for the project is near term, um, which is something very unique for NASA. We usually look at very far term research. But we know for this UAS problem that from our uh, perspective in the project, the operational view is to look at what we do uh, over the next couple of years in order to enable access. And one of the keys to that is how we do this detect and avoid, sense and avoid uh, activity. Um, it's easy, it's fairly easy to do something along the lines of a detect and avoid technology when you have cooperative aircraft that are part of the system that have a transponder so that air traffic control within the FAA knows where the aircraft are, often what their intent is. It's the non-cooperative aircraft that are much more challenging. Those are the ones that can fly uh, perfectly legally in the system um, but don't have to be talking to air traffic control and in many cases don't have to be equipped with any sort of instrumentation. And this is where the pilot normally is able to look out the window and see uh, and avoid those other aircraft and make sure that they stay well clear of those aircraft. With a, a, a system where the unmanned uh, aircraft is being piloted remotely or being piloted just through autonomy, um, we have to figure out a way to uh, technically address that issue. Another issue, as I mentioned on the command and control side, is that you know we're talking about not voice communication where you have a human to back check that, but you have uh, data link communications and um, you have to make sure that, they're, that that system is secure um, and it's scalable so that you can have many, many unmanned aircraft within the system uh, operating on, on the appropriate frequencies. So that's an important aspect too and the, the RTCA Special Committee 228 is looking specifically at what the minimum operational performance standards are for those type uh, of equipage as we move forward to come up with uh, eventually um, standards that would allow a manufacturer to build whatever equipage is required to go on the aircraft to, to solve those problems. All that's wrapped together in human systems integration. You really have to understand the interaction between uh, the pilot and the air traffic controller um, and how that all uh, interoperates within the system. Um, so that's a big part of what we're doing. And then we're, we also in our project um, are looking at um, restricted category certification, um, how we might do something 
uh, beyond what has been the, the FAA has been working on in the Arctic and look at things like um, doing something like precision agriculture, looking at ways that we could enable that kind of an activity um, and come up with standards so that, so that uh, someone could actually uh, conduct a commercial operation in that arena. Um, and that extends a little bit beyond just the restricted uh, use certification and, and off to other types of operational procedures um, for small UAS. So that's one of the big uh, focus areas for us. That's what we're trying to do. And when we think about the vision as we move forward, um, we believe that the, uh, the air transportation system has to be global, it has to be sustainable, and it has to be transformative. And so from that perspective, um, we looked at where where does autonomy fit in, and and we th we want to make sure that what we develop is uh, a, a capability to infuse functionality within the system that we're able to uh, to, to be able to look at um, things that that uh, are are system wide things that uh, are prognostic uh, airport arrival scheduling things that would go across the global system. We want to make sure it's it's sustainable whether that's low carbon or, or, or carbon neutral, um, but looking at, at the ways to optimize the system, um, not just from an operational standpoint, but from an, an environmental strand, uh, standpoint, and then also look at the transformative aspect of it. You know, so not just focus on the things that we know and do today, but look in the far term, um, and you'll hear some of this in the, in the rest of the presentations, about things, everything from uh, doing something uh, like a, a, a very fast uh, vehicle, uh, you know, like a, a, a hypersonic vehicle, all the way to things like um, trying to figure out how to do point-to-point uh, -point, uh, delivery of packages, point-to-point -point delivery of humans um, in, in a fully autonomous way. And so those are the, the kinds of things we look at. Um, and, and so when we think about um, our vision for autonomy, it really is uh, that autonomy has to be implemented in harmony with humans to maximize the benefits. And so you can't just focus on an autonomous activity without knowing what the uh, implications are for um, the human automation teaming. Um, and <clears throat> the system itself has to have certain characteristics, like it has to be self-healing, self-configurable, self-optimizing, in order to really maximize the benefits. And the way that the system has to interoperate with the human is it has to be interactive, informative, uh, adaptable, and collaborative. And so those are all important aspects of, of our vision as we move forward uh, at NASA on autonomy. Um, so when we think about that vision, as I mentioned, uh, autonomy is implemented in, in harmony with humans to maximize the benefits of, the, of uh, uh, aviation to society. There are four sort of cornerstone needs that, um, sort of like four legs of a stool, they all have to be addressed. We at NASA, we're good at technologies and applications, we're good at architectures, uh, but what, what we really have to do and what we really need the community of interest uh, to help us on are, are looking at how we get the trusted systems integrated in other words, how we make sure that that not just the technologists but the whole general public is is aware and is uh, behind the technologies that are being developed. And one of the key ways of doing that is to do that with real uh, test bed testing to actually look, establish a relevant environment and then be able to go out and test the things that we want to implement um, to make sure that we have enough evidence so that people can believe and trust that those systems are safe, secure, um, and ready to be implemented. And, and uh, so that means that not only do we have to look at the technical challenges in terms of how we do uh, things like sense and avoid, how we do human-machine collaboration, but we also have to look at the socio-policy or um, socio-political aspects that include a broad reach uh, across things like liability, uh, public acceptance, moral decision-making, and then uh, the transformation of how humans and, and uh, automation interact. So that's, uh, that's what we're trying to do at, at uh, NASA, and uh, so I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Lori, um, and appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, Chuck, and uh, don't go too far. You know, we will be having you for our um, Q&A at uh, halftime, so really appreciate it. And next up, we have Elizabeth Soltis, and Elizabeth was the UAS Test Site Selection Program Manager and now is the UAS Test Site Program Manager. The, FAA, the FAA's UAS Test Site Program is managed by Elizabeth Soltis, 23-year FAA veteran 
who began her federal career designing air traffic control facilities to house research and full-scale development systems. She has represented FAA in managing interagency agreements with NASA and the Department of Defense in order to coordinate cross-agency research portfolios. She's managed a shared situational awareness initiative to advance net centricity, then resident within the Joint Program and Development Office. Elizabeth managed a portfolio of contracts which supports research and systems engineering required for the next generation air transportation system. This portfolio this portfolio has had an estimated value of about $6.4 billion over 10 years and has been described as the largest set of awards in FAA history. Soltis also has private sector experience in engineering and finance. She's worked as a structural engineer designing skyscrapers in Manhattan and was employed by the former Kidder Peabody & Co. in the Mergers and Acquisitions Department. She's, she has a bachelor's degree in science, applied mathematics, and a five-year engineering degree with emphasis in structural engineering and a master's degree in business administration. So it is a pleasure to have you here with us, Elizabeth, and welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Lori, as well as Trimble and Inside GNSS for hosting today. And thank you for extending the invitation and affording the FAA the opportunity to speak today. Key legislation became and was enacted into law February 14, 2012. That legislation was affiliated with integrating unmanned aircraft systems into the National Airspace System, UAS into the NAS. In particular today, I'd like to address the selection of the six test sites as well as how we came about selecting those six test sites, where we are today, and where we're going in the future. A pilot project, which was listed under the FAA Modernization and Reform Act, was to, in fact, six, select these six test sites. With that, we were to take into consideration geographic and climatic diversity, as well as the location of ground infrastructure and research needs. We were also to consult with NASA as well as DOD on the selection process. After the selection of the test sites, the agency was to establish a project at a test range, and it was to be operational no later than 180 days after the date in which the program was established. We, the agency, received significant interest. We had 25 applicants from 24 states. We received approximately 30,000 pages in proposals. We also received 300 airspaces that were submitted that the agency reviewed for safety. We had 100 individuals across three agencies, that is NASA, FAA, as well as DOD, who acted as evaluators as well as advisors on the selection of the six test sites. The day we released our solicitation, which in other agencies would be called a request for proposal, we had over 650 articles published nationwide. That interest has continued to date. Across the 25 applicants, there were 643 team members. We ensured that as we selected the six test sites that the agency um, continued with public engagement. So initially, prior to the release of the actual solicitation, and soon after the law was enacted, we put out um, a PowerPoint briefing, essentially, on the Federal Register, and we held two days of public listening. And at that time, we had 800 registrants. Uh, we also received over 200 comments as well as questions on our slide deck affiliated with how we were going to select the six test sites. Later in the summer, we um, looked at defining our solicitation and having it ready for release. At that time, privacy concerns became relevant within the agency. So as we prepared to release the solicitation, in tandem, we also looked at how we could hold the test sites to a specific level of privacy and watch them be compliant with this um, privacy requirement. We did not put out these privacy requirements without first selecting a federal register for comment as well as holding another public listening session where we had over 600 registrants. That public listening session, which was the following spring, 
was led by John Picari, and at the time he was the Secretary's um, Deputy of Transportation. The administrator himself engaged in the selection process, and he, in fact, was the selecting official for the six test sites. The test sites were, in fact, selected December 30th, 2013, and soon after, the FAA went to each of the six test sites that were selected Furthermore, the William J. Hughes Technical Center, located in Atlantic City, hosted a 100-person technical interchange meeting soon after the selection. The representation was not only the six test sites, but also many FAA personnel with expertise in specific areas. This forum was hosted by the head of the Aviation Subcommittee, Congressman Frank Lobiondo. Here we have a depiction of the six test sites that represent geographic and climate diversity, as well as meeting the agency's research needs and supporting unique ground-based infrastructure. We have the University of Alaska, and the University of Alaska has many team members, but of note are the team members of Hawaii and Oregon. They represent airspaces that, aside from the University of Alaska over um, Alaska, plans to conduct operations. These operations are not necessarily contigu contiguous in that we do, will not necessarily have corridors that connect Alaska to Oregon and Hawaii for operations. Furthermore, we selected the state of Nevada, New York Griffith International Airport, North Dakota Department of Commerce, Texas A&M University, located in Corpus Christi, and the Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. This applicant and awardee was also conjoined with the state of New Jersey because they also plan to conduct operations over the state of New, Jer New Jersey as well. Across the six applicants, the FAA is confident that the agency's research goals, and our goals are um, system safety and data gathering, aircraft certification, command and control, link issues, control station layout and certification, ground and airborne sense and avoid, as well as environmental impacts will be met. We recognize that the test sites are not the only locations where research will be conducted. As Chuck previously mentioned, NASA, as well as DOD, international harmonization, um, and others are out conducting research, but for the FAA, the live trials are planned to be conducted um, at these locations. What's unique about the FAA Modernization and Reform Act is that there's a suspense date. It's five years after a date of enactment, the agency is supposed to terminate the program, and then we owe a report to Congress a few months later on how we did. Associated with that, the agency is working with the test sites to ensure that research that is conducted at the test sites um, is managed and informed by the agency so that we're able to prepare this report of findings and conclusions soon after the end of the program. What other areas of note um, in these test sites is that today, if you want to fly in the national airspace system and your public aircraft operator, you have the means to obtain a certificate of waiver, waiver and authorization. If you're a civil operator, you can receive an experimental. These test sites will be able to receive both. But beyond that authority that we would grant them either through an experimental and or a COA, we plan to bestow upon the test sites more latitude. And the way we plan to do that is that we have further requirements on these test sites than we do for either of the applicants in the experimental on the civil side arena and or on the public side through COAs. Through a trusted relationship of understanding that they have a repeatable safety management system as well as other areas that we are requiring the test sites to adhere to, the agency will work with the test sites to afford this latitude. And the last thing that I want to discuss today, um, besides where we're going, is among the other requirements, the test site operators 
will be required to comply with federal, state, as well as other laws protecting an individual's rights to privacy. They must have publicly available privacy policies and a written plan for data use and retention. Some of the data that the test sites will have will not be of interest to the agency. They also must conduct an annual review of privacy practices that allow for public comment. The agency is working with the test sites on data and who will host the data and what research will be accomplished. The agency is working on a plan where some of the data will be held by the actual test sites and retained by the test sites and upon the agency's need we will request this data predicated on of course the research that the test sites will be accomplishing. Furthermore, the agency has its own data. Um, we may have communications data, we may have data affiliated with radar, and again predicated on the research that is accomplished, we may in fact use that data, retain it, or further analyze it and create new data after we've done data reduction and analysis. All these findings are planned to be collaborative in order to help us with the certification process and, and expanding integration into the NAS. Lori, thank you for hosting. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. And I'd like to ask all of our panel members to step back to the virtual podium. And uh, we'll start with the questions that are currently in the queue. This first one going out uh, to you, Ro. Dana is asking, the recent European Navigation Conference included many presentations about GNSS vulnerability to jamming and spoofing, including one that highlighted the specific challenges for unmanned aerial vehicles. What kind of resilient navigation systems are being developed and planned to counter jamming and spoofing? Uh, thank you, Lori. Um, I'd like to address that in two areas. Uh, first is that the uh, jamming and spoofing is an issue primarily for the communications link. So a portion of the answer has to be addressing uh, means of doing communication links which do not have a um, vulnerability to jamming and spoofing. And you can never solve that problem perfectly, but there's a great number of solutions that have been developed in DOD and expanded into the civilian world over the years, going back, gosh, 30 years I think now, that can do that. The second aspect is incorporating into the navigation system degrees of autonomy such that if the link itself is lost, whether it be by jamming or spoofing attempts, that number one, it can recognize that a spoofing effort has occurred. In other words, it's not getting instructions from its proper um, operator or that jamming is at that it no longer has a link with the operator and then it will revert to a tested and acceptable autonomous solution that will cause it to return home or to follow other instructions that have been incorporated into the system. All right, thanks so much, Ro. Uh, this next one going over to you, Chuck. Uh, Daryl's asking, do you think automatic avoidance technology will ever be good enough to ensure safety in the NAS? Uh, yeah, absolutely I do. I think that, uh, that uh, te technologically, in fact, um, I think that what we will come up with will be um, probably better than uh, the average uh, human. And as a result, I think that a lot of the technologies that we develop will be able to make their way back onto particularly general av aviation aircraft to assist um, in uh, the human pilot actually being able to uh, avoid some accidents. I mean, w we, we see today that a lot of our safety uh, issues in terms of, of aircraft that, uh, that either have near misses or have collisions uh, are, are oftentimes on the uh, general aviation side and I think that the technologies that we develop will actually not only be good enough to uh, safely integrate UAS and the NAS but also be able to be retrofitted back to, uh, to help the, the rest of the general aviation community. All right, thank you. And this one over to you, John. Bet's asking, or I think might be Betty, uh, the future up the future up there now seems to assume only the larger UAS that need runways. What about the very small UAS that are within the reach of the general public? 
Uh, well, I think there are actually two parts to, to uh, that question, and, and uh, the, the first is that uh, there will be uh, some small UAS rules coming out uh, later this year, and Elizabeth may want to comment on that a little bit later, um, that will uh, pr provide us with a means for how we're going to use small UAS for commercial purposes. Uh, the second piece of it is that uh, I, there is an intent to uh, permit radio-controlled aircraft or hobbyists uh, to continue to to fly uh, uh, these RC aircraft uh, that in a lot of cases don't look a whole lot different that, than uh, the vehicles that are being flown for commercial purposes for the, on the smaller end. So uh, a lot of the quadcopters that we see flying around with a GoPro camera uh, will actually have some some commercial uh, applications in in the not too distant future. So, um, I think there's a lot of t a lot of attention being paid to that, and, and we expect that the industry is really going to be focused in that area uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, I, I think we're thinking 80 to 90 percent of the industry is going to be in the small UES world. So, uh, uh, we are very much looking at the smalls. Okay. All right, this next question for you, Elizabeth, and Frank is asking, uh, what sort of time frames are you looking at in getting all of this at least minimally operational? Frank, uh, thank you. Great question. Um, on the 21st um, last month, the administrator, Michael Huerta, arrived in North Dakota and provided the cer first certificate of authorization and waiver to North Dakota to commence operations. So we were actually two and a half months ahead of the mandate and North Dakota, it is my understanding, started operations this Monday. Furthermore, um, the administrator this past weekend, as well as Monday, visited Alaska and again handed a certificate of authorization and waiver to Alaska, and I think uh, Ro will elaborate further on that, as far as being able to conduct operations. And that was with specific airframes for both North Dakota as well as Alaska in specific airspaces that had been approved by Air Traffic and Coordinated. And again, Alaska commenced operations, and this was two months ahead of schedule. So, we're looking um, we're looking at conducting operations at all six test sites, hopefully within six months from the date of selection. And currently, the agency has nine additional certificates of authorization and waiver that are UAS test site centric. Um, they're a little unique; they require more than the common uh, COA. And we are looking at those. Several of the test sites have provided more than one airspace and more than one airframe requesting to conduct operations. All right, and thank you. And um, folks, that, that's all we have time for in terms of questions at this midpoint. We will be uh, coming back in and answering more of your questions uh, at the end of the program. So at this point, I'd like to move on to our next poll. Now, um, I've got two polls here in a row. Uh, this first one coming up on your screen. Uh, while it is possible, sorry. Okay, going to go ahead and launch that poll. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, letting us know what will be the leading commercial application of the UAS in the next five years, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and select your number one. I know the screen says top two, but go ahead and give us your number one leading commercial application of the UAS in the next five years. Is it environmental precision agriculture, photography for film, media, news, traffic, communications networks, personal air vehicles for transport of humans or door-to-door -door transport of goods. Now here's the catch. I'm going to be putting up another poll question in just a moment, asking you the same question, but in the next 20 years. And we're going to compare the results. So right now we're looking at the five-year time frame. And let's take a look at the 20 years. And again, I'm going to ask you, go ahead and just select your top one. I realize that there's a possibility of selecting more, but go ahead and give us your top leading commercial application in the next 20 years. Okay, let's look at that first poll that we put out. And I'm showing 33% environmental, 57% photography for film, media, news, and traffic. And you can see a, a smattering of the other three. 
Uh, any comments from our uh, panel on this question in the five-year mark? Uh, Lori, this is John Green. Uh, uh, you know, I think that the, uh, the, the top two areas are, are the ones that I would agree with are, are going to be uh, uh, the ones that we're going to see the most of. I do think that the, uh, especially the precision agriculture is going to have a huge economic impact, however, and I, I think that's going to be the leading one in, in terms of dollar value. All right. Thank you for those comments. Let's take a look at the 20 year. And it looks a little bit different to me. <laughs> Any comments on um, on those results? Yeah, well, this is Chuck. Uh, uh, I think that um, that shows to, to me that uh, it's it, it is a pretty broad spectrum of things that uh, we think will be available in that time frame, and and that's why NASA's uh, focused on looking across the board at many of these things. Uh, I do think that um, after Jeff Bezos did his uh, his little sixty minute uh, discussion about door-to-door -door transport of goods, I think um, people started to resonate with that and that, that gets to you know some of the public acceptance aspects of it is that I think the public sees some real benefit to them in things like door-to-door -door transport of goods and I think as a result of that it'll help drive some of the technologies that get developed. Okay, thank you so much and uh, folks we're going to get back into the content aspect of our presentation. Uh, directly from our presenters. Next up, we have Ro Bailey, and Ro Bailey is a uh, retired brigadier general in the United States Air Force and director of the Pan Pacific UAS Test Range Complex and deputy director of the Alaska Center for Unmanned Aircraft Systems Integration, RDT&E. Among other posts during a lengthy USFA career, Bailey served as the commander, Cheyenne Mountain Operations Center, Cheyenne Mountain uh, Air Force Station in Colorado, where she was responsible for executing the North American Aerospace Defense Command's Integrated Tactical Warning and Attack Assessment Mission, the, UA the U.S. Northern Command's Homeland Defense Mission, and the U.S. Strategic Command's Space and Missile Warning Support. She earned a B.S. degree with honors from Purdue University and an M.S. from the Air Force Institute of Technology. Ro, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Lori. I'd like to also thank GNSS and Trimble for sponsoring this uh, opportunity. And I welcome the opportunity to talk a little bit about my favorite subject, which is operating unmanned aircraft systems in Alaska. So let's just get straight into it. Um, Alaska is kind of an ideal location for doing unmanned aircraft. But to look at it another way, unmanned aircraft systems are ideal for Alaska also with our remote challenging uh, uh, terrain and our extreme weather conditions ranging from um, temperate rainforest to uh, Arctic conditions, having the ability to replace manned operations where those operations can be very dangerous for humans uh, or looking in areas where it's dull to pay attention to um, hour after hour of looking downward at things, it, unmanned aircraft really do end up producing the best possible opportunity uh, for improving how we do things. And what we're doing at the University of Alaska, at the Alaska Center for Unmanned Aircraft Systems Integration, is research. Uh, primarily for small unmanned aircraft systems, we would look at integrating unique payloads and finding new ways of operating the systems, we call it Pathfinder missions, within government and science communities and with a particular emphasis on the Arctic region. What you see in the pictures there are some of the aircraft systems that we own and or operate and in some cases we have these systems leased to us for operation. They're not even all the ones that we're currently operating. We have done a great deal of work over the years. We've been in this business since 2001. In the last two years, we've conducted over 150 mission flight days each year. So that's quite a bit of flying. Now, a lot of people know that the military use unmanned aircraft systems already. But what are the civilian applications? We've heard a little bit of talk about precision agriculture. For us, it really is about research. We have been doing data collection for ourselves, for other universities, and by that I mean the scientists who are faculty here. 
We've done it for fe federal and state agencies who have very specific areas that they'd like to investigate for the potential use of unmanned aircraft systems, and as well for private businesses. But I emphasize what we're doing isn't commercial, we're doing research. We've done mapping. Uh, there's a unique capability taking on that dull aspect of sm small unmanned aircraft systems to take detailed pictures, very precise times, and then after they land, doing some post-processing to create these very detailed maps. In the world of civil support, we can very quickly respond to emergencies. We can assist with finding uh, victims using our search and rescue capabilities. We can use these systems to monitor various species that are challenged due to climate change, for example, or for herd management. That could be for ranchers or it could also be for uh, fish and wildlife um, hunting management. We can assist with spill response for oil spill, and in Alaska that's a big deal because there's a lot of that going on. Law enforcement is interested in order to be able to do forensic mapping of traffic accidents, for example. And of course we've heard many different areas ideas about how commercial interests are involved. But I emphasize again, the work that we do is research. We're looking into how these systems could be used. So let's look at a couple of them. Uh, here's one of them. This is in the public safety arena. It's an exercise that we did for uh, the Guard and the purpose was to assess the ability of unmanned aircraft systems to improve response to a major aircraft crash with mass casualties. And so we took two unmanned aircraft systems out to Bethel, Alaska. The temperatures ranged from minus 35 to minus 50 in the few days that we were out there. There was manned aviation, so we needed to coordinate with the manned aviation in the process. And one accomplishment that we made in that particular exercise is that we were able to locate the uh, all of the live victims out there in a space of two hours where the ordinary approach which was also undertaken took 12 hours to find them. In those temperatures I can tell you the uh, chances of survival of all the victims would have been very slim and so we determined that this was a very significant capability to add to the kit bag for search and rescue. And we did some mapping and some other things as well. And you're going to see on the next slide here that the infrared capability against a very cold background points out humans very, very vividly, and that's in that upper right picture. Down below, you can see the results of the mapping that we did. While we were only flying at about 100 to 200 feet, when you stitch all the pictures together, you get that picture on the left that makes it look like you're very high. But in actuality, that's many, many pictures stitched together through post-processing. Another capability, and again in extreme conditions, was researching the potential for using unmanned aircraft systems to assist, in this case, in laying a hose from a Russian tanker to the storage tanks in Nome, Alaska. This is a case where their last fuel delivery for the year didn't make it because of extreme storms off the coast. And so a, a icebreaker plus the Russian tanker brought oil in, but they couldn't get any closer than a mile from the shore. Ice has a tendency to produce open leads and sharp ridges that can cut hoses and create a spill. And so our role was to assess whether an unmanned aircraft could assist in rapidly deploying that hose and putting it in a, a safe area where it would endure throughout the transfer of fuel. And we were successful in doing that and so we now know that this is something that potentially could be used in the future. Another area is the environmental area and you saw that on the poll. Here is a case where we had endangered species, the stellar sea lion. The assessment was to determine whether the data that had been collected by manned aviation was actually complete. And so we were also looking at which of two different types of unmanned aircraft systems would be effective, a small rotorcraft or a hand-launched fixed wing. We were able to conduct 39 missions. We were, uh, collected a great deal of data and we were able to take a look at that data and at the quantity of data, compare it with the manned results and determine that in fact the unmanned aircraft were able to locate a great many more animals than the manned system had been able to do. 
And you can tell by looking at the lower left picture that the animals were completely unaware of our presence. They had no idea we were there, and so the impact on them is uh, minimal to zero, which is an important thing. The next chart looks at how this can be used to assess infrastructure. And in this case, we're determining whether using an unmanned aircraft system has the ability to provide the kind of data necessary to meet requirements for periodic review of infrastructure for its safety, for its integrity, uh, to inspect for spill or leaks, and to do so under extreme conditions. And so. Uh, there's a variety of different projects that are actually reflected here. I'm not going to go into all the details, but the bottom line is we were able to determine that there's significant utility here. We're still in the process of developing certain specific sensors and determining uh, the uh, comparison with manned aviation to ensure that it's much, much better, but it appears that that's going to be the case. So. We have a great number of potential projects out in front of us for the next couple of years. Each time we do a presentation like this or to other people or do a project uh, researching capability, what we end up with are more and more ideas for uh, other ways that unmanned aircraft could be used and, uh, and therefore end up developing new research projects for the express purpose of assessing those capabilities in the future. So I'm not going to go into the list that's here, but I'd be happy to take questions on them later on. So let me go on for a moment and talk about the approach to resolving the FAA concerns. Both Elizabeth and Chuck have already talked in detail about the concerns. So the only aspect I want to bring here is that we view that the pathway to resolving those concerns will be through doing the kind of research we've already done, doing the safety studies which are always necessary before we actually embark on any project, and then ultimately developing the kinds of standards and technology and doing the data collection and analysis that uh, inevitably improves the knowledge base for all who are concerned. And of course, as one of the test sites, we view that as being one of our roles. Uh, and I believe that's exactly what Elizabeth was talking about as well. Here's another picture of the Pan Pacific UAS Test Range Complex, which is our test site. Uh, we see it this way primarily because uh, we think that the potential for operating between the sites will offer some uh, longer range potential for looking at very high altitude operations and the ability to do that uh, over marine environments, <clears throat> excuse me, so that um, it doesn't uh, require going over any populated areas. The states of Oregon and Hawaii are very much involved with us. They are part of our principals in the team. We have an additional 56 participating team members who are drawn from state agencies from all three states, a variety of universities in the three states but also beyond there. From corporations and small business who see the test sites as an opportunity to contribute to the integration of unmanned aircraft systems into the national airspace system. And we have native groups and aviation associations who want to be a part of it, but also who want to assure that in many cases that their manned aviation operations are considered adequately as we move forward and we welcome their participation. We also have international partners with a most significant one being Iceland. Uh, we actually have done some testing over there already. Uh, their roles are different. And uh, our concept with the test site is that there's basically dual tracks to capture the kind of information that will be useful to the FAA. The obvious one is clients who desire to test their unmanned aircraft systems, but not only their aircraft, also related systems such as um, uh, ground-based sense and avoid systems. And then the projects that we normally get under the Alaska Center, because you can collect data from everything you do as I've already discussed. The next topic area is looking at the Arctic airspace, which is created as a part of the FAA Modernization and Reform Act. The area you see here is what is defined as the Arctic airspace and the law um, establish the rules that you see here. But rather than read all these details, let's just summarize very quickly. Essentially, 
Small aircraft under this rule will be permitted to operate 24-7 up to at least 2,000 feet with launch and recovery access to and from selected coastal sites for all users and users, which means commercial, model, and public in the permanent airspace located between the Aleutians and the Canadian border over the uh, ocean there. So um, in order to accomplish that, the FAA is working closely with industry and as a result of doing so, we're able to um, allow the first commercial non-COA flights uh, last fall. But they did this using the military exception. Clearly there's a great deal of industry interest from industry operating in this area, but there's also concern from the aviation operators. So we haven't formed a specific collaboration, but we're talking with the idea of the test site collaborating with the industry and the uh, part of the FAA specifically working these areas in order to help collect the data that's necessary to get UAS certification to allow it to happen. And we expect to move forward with that in a variety of areas. So in summary, we're assessing and demonstrating civilian utility. We're accelerating data collection for the FAA integration efforts. We believe the Arctic airspace adds an interesting dimension and will further accelerate the integration. And, and we're hoping that someday we might actually get to see this. And with that, I conclude. Thank you, Lori. Back over to you. Well, thank you so much, Ro. And folks, next up, we do have our final presenter for today, John Green. And John Green is the Associate Director for Strategic Planning and Development for Virginia Tech's Institute for Critical Technology and Applied Science. Until recently, he also served as the Interim Director of the Mid-Atlantic Aviation Partnership. He joined Virginia Tech in September 2009 after a successful career in the United States Navy, rising to the rank of captain and, among other posts, serving as commanding officer of the Naval Surface Warfare Center. Uh, Dam Neck Division in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Green earned a Master's of Arts degree in National Security Affairs from the Navy Postgraduate School and a Bachelor's of Science in Political Science from the U.S. Naval Academy. It's a pleasure to have you with us today, John. How are you? I'm fine, Laurie, and thank you, and, and thank you to Inside GNNS and Trimble to the opportunity today. Uh, I'm honored to, to be part of this panel. So um, I've got just a few slides that I'm going to share with you to uh, talk about uh, what, what the future looks like uh, and then uh, discuss some of the discrete steps that I think that, that we're going to see over the next few years. And um, a lot of us were captivated uh, last fall when Jeff Bezos and, uh, uh, rolled out on uh, 60 Minutes his vision of uh, Amazon Prime Air where he would be using unmanned aircraft system to deliver packages and, and his vision is to, to do that in the relatively near future. Uh, and so I think a lot of us have started to think about this as the end state and this is where we're going but I, I think it's a little bit more complicated to that, than that and I think we're looking at something a little bit more like this where perhaps this vehicle is, is the Amazon vehicle but we've got a target vehicle over here and maybe this one's Walmart. Um, this one is a, a, a police vehicle that is doing a survey of uh, an accident scene. This one right here may be the, uh, uh, the uh, 6 o'clock news taking uh, footage that, uh, that we'll share. And this one up here may be uh, the FedEx uh, uh, vehicle that is going to be delivering packages uh, to, uh, from New York to, to Los Angeles that will then be delivered on an Amazon vehicle. Uh, sometime in the future, so we get a lot more complicated airspace, um, and so the you know the view that that uh, one company could be out there and flying some of these things around uh, from uh, a, a distri distribution center to to people's houses uh, is probably something that could be done in the relatively new future near future. But uh, if you get multiple uh, vehicles from different organizations that aren't coordinated, that's where our problems come. And that's why it's going to take us a little while to do this. Uh, and it gets even a little bit more complicated because if you can deliver packages, you can deliver people too. Uh, so the potential for uh, personal air vehicles uh, uh, flying around the cities in, in uh, uh, the thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands or even millions uh, is not out of the question in in the near future and or, or in the future. Um, and I know that the folks at NASA have been looking at this with uh, for some time. So uh, the, the future of unmanned aircraft systems is, is really exciting. 
uh, but it's going to take us a while to get there. And, and, and with that, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the steps that we are uh, going to have to take in order to, to uh, achieve that future. And, and the first one is where we are today. And, and uh, um, Elizabeth and Roe have talked about what's going on in, in the test sites. Um, we at Virginia Tech have one as well. And, and uh, the, the, the six test sites are working together to try and develop um, a, 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 a body of data. Uh, and that data is then going to allow the FAA to make informed, uh, data-driven decisions uh, about what can fly where under what circumstances. Um, and, and so uh, as, we, as we fly more, we'll be able to, uh, to better uh, assess the risk and make better decisions about what is safe to fly under, under uh, certain circumstances. Uh, so step number one uh, is uh, allowing small UAS uh, to fly within, within visual line of sight. And, and this, this is the thing that we expect our, our small UAS rules will allow us the, the pathway to, to achieve in the next couple of years. Um, we'll, we'll be doing this in low risk airspace uh, at low altitudes, uh, basically where no one else is flying. Um, and we'll specify a distance from airports that we're going to have to have to, to keep away. So there are going to be some significant limitations on where we fly. And, uh, but even with that, there will be some tremendous uh, possibilities for, for application. Uh, the first one we've talked about is agriculture, and we think that, that, that that's huge. Uh, emergency response is another one. Uh, we see the, the potential for unmanned aircraft uh, to, to uh, significantly uh, uh, improve resp responses to situations like uh, Ro uh, discussed earlier. Um, we think that there are some infrastructure inspections that we can do in line of sight very quickly. These would be things like bridges, um, cell phone towers, uh, maybe uh, power line towers. Uh, we can do inspection. Uh, and, and the last thing is that uh, UAVs have been uh, used for some time by the military for imagery. Um, and we think that, that photography is going to be, uh, again, a, a huge thing that we'll, we'll be able to do. So the media will be using those in, in, in these res under these restrictions. So we're not going to be f probably flying in, in, uh, in downtown New York uh, taking, taking video in the short term. Uh, but eventually we're going to get there. Um, so the challenges, and, and one of them that, that, uh, that Chuck pointed out earlier is the, the uncooperative aircraft, uh, the aircraft that does not have a transponder, so we can't tell uh, automatically where it is. And, and the way we get around that over the short term in these visual line of sight operations is we have a safety officer that can put the uh, unmanned aircraft in a, in a safe condition, uh, either on the ground or, or, or avoid a, uh, the uncooperative aircraft as it comes in. And then the policy issues that we're going to need to address over the, uh, uh, the immediate future is uh, how do we certify a particular UAS as, as safe and ready to fly and what are the, the uh, qualifications that are required for a pilot in order, in order to, to uh, fly these aircraft. So that's what we're going to be our, our, our first step. And, and the next one is similar um, in that we will be, uh, uh, again, flying small UAS, so probably under 55 pounds. Uh, but in this case, we'll be, we'll be going further distances. So we'll be going beyond line of sight. Um, in the same type of airspace, we'll, we'll keep our distance from airports, we'll be low, um, we'll be uh, in areas that there's not a whole lot of traffic, um, and, and this will expand our opportunities to, for, for applications such as um, uh, longer range emergency response, so search and rescue type operations. Um, pipeline inspections is something that a number of companies and are, are very interested in, and, and Rhodes already been involved in, in doing some, some of that up in, in Alaska. And she mentioned the, the potential for, for fisheries and wildlife management uh, that we think is, is really going to be a, a, a boon to some of the, uh, the, the federal agents and state agencies. Um, so our challenge here becomes a little bit more difficult in the detect, to avoid, uh, detect and avoid uh, realm uh, in that you won't have the visual observer. So we'll have to have the ability to, to uh, detect uh, uh, aircraft and you know, the, the, the glider, the, the lighter than air. Those type of things are the things that we, we have to think about as, as, we, uh, as we move on. Um, so s step one and two are pretty obvious. Step three is perhaps a little less obvious, but it's the same principle in that 
uh, if we talk about high altitude, long endurance aircraft, uh, they're flying at altitudes where there is very little flying. Uh, so if we are able to, to get an aircraft up to uh, oh, about 60,000 feet and, and keep it up there for an extended period of time, those aircraft can essentially perform uh, the mission that satellites are doing today. And that becomes, uh, that becomes very attractive from a price standpoint and, and uh, allows us to do some of the applications like communications and uh, the imagery that they're done by satellite today. Um, so a very, attractive, uh, um, a, a very attractive opportunity for uh, sort of the midterm. Um, the challenge here b becomes primarily the platform. And, and there are uh, some of these vehicles today uh, but we're we're getting uh, you know uh, we're getting uh, endurances of, of maybe a week or something like that. We're talking about uh, vehicles that are able to uh, uh, stay up there for months at time, essentially limitless in, in their endurance, um, and ha are able to carry a significant payload so that so that they can do something while they're up there. So the the, the challenges that we face uh, here are, are how do we transit to al altitude? Um, how do how do we uh, develop the platforms that, that, that can do this and um, and that leads us to the last step or actually series of steps and this is a uh, a long term gradual evolution in that we in which we will gradually ease the restrictions on on what we can fly uh, where we can fly and how we can fly it uh, and we think that when, once we reach this step there are applications that we haven't even anticipated that that uh, we'll be able to start taking advantage of. So the challenges here uh, are are really uh, 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 similar to the ones that we that we faced with with uh, the the earlier steps, and and that's the issue of spectrum. So we'll want to we'll want to have the ability to communicate with these aircraft reliably. And how do we do that? Are we going to have dedicated spectrum? Are we going to share spectrum? Um, and, and we've talked a little bit earlier about the, the importance of, of, of reliability in terms of, of, of cybersecurity. So uh, while these are, are challenges that we face uh, in, in the short term with the smaller aircraft um, and that we are working on today, these really become salient when we start talking about larger aircraft and we talk, talk about um, thousands or perhaps hundreds of thousands of these, these uh, vehicles flying around. Um, so in the policy realm, uh, this brings into the issue um, the, the, the concept of, of the dedicated pilot. So today, uh, the, the intention of the FAA uh, for the immediate future is that, that each vehicle will have a single pilot that will be dedicated to operating that vehicle safely. Now that's certainly not the view that Jeff Bezos has for how Amazon is going to operate. He's he's viewing a, a fleet of these um, w with a number of, of uh, pilots or operators that would uh, control several aircraft, and, and autonomy would would allow us to, to fly these vehicles safely. So we've got some policy issues and some human systems uh, integration issues that we're going to have to deal with in order to to complete this evolution. So uh, this one's going to take us a while. So um, I, I think that the bottom line here is that you know we've got some really exciting things coming in in the world of UAS technologies. I expect that we're going to see a relatively slow rollout of ha of these technologies, and we're going to see the smalls flying first and in, in in relatively limited roles. Um, and there are some technical challenges that we have to face, but but the the largest obstacles are are policy in nature. Uh, and so with that, I will turn it over to you, Lori. Thank you so much, John, and. Uh, folks, I have up on the screen some next steps. So certainly if you're uh, interested to go out in uh, on the Internet to www.insidegnss.com forward slash webinars, you'll find a link to the PDF of today's presentation if you'd like to review it again, and as well a PDF version of resources that uh, our presenters have shared with us for all of you for future reference. As well, if you'd like to contact any of our speakers on the line today, you've got their email addresses here uh, on the screen. Of course, it will be in that presentation that you can download from the website at your convenience. At this point, I would like to ask all of our speakers to step back to the virtual podium, if you would. And we'll start to 
address some of these questions that are coming in. This first one is going to go over to you, Elizabeth, and the question is, what is the agency requesting that the test sites research? So the agency is actually not requesting that the test sites research anything, and the reason is the agency currently does not have a budget line item for the test sites. The agency is collaborating with the test sites, we're reviewing their research portfolio, and as they apply to conduct operations, we're very cognizant of their research curriculum. But at this juncture, again, we're not in a task order driven environment where we have a contract and we're paying the test sites to research. So we have no authority to um, exclusively ask them to conduct research on our behalf at this juncture. Thank you, Elizabeth. Next one here for John, uh, Bill's asking, can you elaborate on what the policy issues are? Uh, sure. Well, I, I think there, there are two general categories, and, and, and the first one is uh, for the safety of flight issues is, is the, the FAA has some, some regulations that are out there today that are designed around manned aircraft, and, and we're going to need to evolve those um, for unmanned aircraft because uh, it, it's, it, it's different. And, and, you know, the fundamental one is uh, manned aircraft are required to see and avoid. So they're able, uh, able to see aircraft around them and obstacles around them and maneuver to avoid them. Um, and uh, seeing, as defined by the FAA, includes or requires that you have uh, a human eyeball in the, in the loop. So um, our, our, um, our vehicles will, may have uh, electro-optical sensors, but uh, uh, they won't have the field of view that you have from a human eyeball. The, the sense of perception may be a little bit challenging. So we've got to work on that. So th that's number one. The second one, I think, is um, the social aspects, and the, and the primary one today is privacy. So uh, what can uh, a, a law enforcement agency use uh, unmanned aircraft for? Um, and perhaps more salient than the one I really think about a lot is, is what can a private citizen use uh, his radio-controlled aircraft for? So. Um, and the, the the prime example is if I go over to my to, to my neighbor's house and stand on his lawn, uh, he tells me to leave. I'm trespassing, and I and I, and I'm required to leave, or I can be arrested. Uh, I can fly a, an unmanned aircraft uh, over his lawn, uh, and and probably not be trespassing at the moment. So we've got to, we've got to figure out what the right rules are uh, to make sure that we're we're meeting those privacy requirements. Okay, thank you so much. This one over to you, Chuck. John is asking, the issue of DAA between UAS and non-cooperative aircraft seems to assume that they will occupy the same airspace legally. Is this not a major risk, at least within the first years of deployment? Uh, do you believe that segregation through zoning and separation regulations can be implemented in the early stages of development to preclude this issue? Uh, okay, well, thanks for that question. It's um, uh, really one that uh, I guess I'd like to expand on. First off, I, I think that um, our philosophy at NASA has been, and by the way, that's a big policy question. Our, our uh, approach at NASA has been that we want to integrate unmanned aircraft and not segregate them. Um, I think that, uh, you know, and I spent uh, 11 years in the FAA as an air traffic controller um, and have a lot of respect for um, the general aviation community and the airspace that they that they operate in and I, and so what we really want to do and we think we can do is find a way to safely integrate um, uh, unmanned aircraft with manned aircraft so whether or not it's at uh, a, a low altitude uh, or at a high altitude um, I think we can do that and a lot of the things that that RTCA SC 228 has been working on and we, we've been uh, heavily involved in in 228 um, we, we were kind of the the front runners for setting up 203 and uh, and actually have followed through with 228 um, or the organization really providing the majority of the data to validate uh, the minimum operational performance standards but that's all getting to try to have unmanned aircraft integrated and not segregated um, I think that as as we move forward the FAA could try to do something where they they put off a segregated uh, segment of airspace and basically say in order to operate in there you have to have certain equipage such as uh, using um, you know so, some sort of a ADSB um, but uh, but the the problem is then you're taking away some of the the rights of 
of those that would like to fly without that equipage. So we think that you can actually uh, have the best of both worlds and be able to do that. Um, and one of the other things that we're looking at uh, in terms of overall uh, getting unmanned aircraft in the nest, particularly at the low altitude, is trying to figure out how to integrate um, in the future, how to integrate unmanned aircraft in the same regime where there's a lot of smaller aircraft operating today, uh, helicopters, uh, crop dusters, etc. Um, and one of the big research activities being led out of NASA Ames Research Center by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Parmel uh, Koperdeker is uh, the unmanned uh, aircraft system traffic management, which is taking a look at how you would manage all of the aircraft in there, whether they're uh, remotely piloted, unmanned, or autonomous, or manned aircraft, and how they could interoperate within that system. So even at the low altitude, um, where there's a lot of challenges and there'll be a lot of vehicles, um, we believe the way forward is integration, not segregation. Okay, thank you. Uh, this one, we're going to go over to you, Ro. Regina is asking, is there any effort to develop operational procedures that allow for varying levels of autonomy, which may be partially dependent on location and purpose of UAS flight? Thanks for the question, Regina. Uh, happy to answer that one. And the we are certainly engaged in that kind of effort ourselves right now. Before we can get to operational procedures, we have to assess whether a level of autonomy, uh, one level versus another level of autonomy is actually important to us. And so there are levels of autonomy today that are we believe are important for safety purposes. That is, if we lose the link, it's important to us to know for sure that the system is capable of performing the um, loss link procedures that were approved and so uh, that's an important one to have there we believe in almost everything but then when you get to more significant levels of autonomy where you it may perhaps at the ultimate level is you send it off on a mission and it takes care of the entire mission and you don't communicate with it again until it gets back then I think you are right it's going to be very dependent on location and what the purpose is if we're sending the system 300 miles out over the Chukchi Sea towards the North Pole, we can be pretty confident that at about a thousand feet there aren't too many other aircraft out there, as in none. And so it's very reasonable to consider that that level of autonomy is acceptable. But if we're doing it in Fairbanks or we're doing it in more populated areas anywhere in the country, then we're going to need to have the human in the loop and able to interact and immediately respond to react to any kind of change in the environment that could create a safety risk of some kind. So first we have, as I say, first we determine what level of autonomy is necessary for safety. Then we need to identify the operational procedures appropriate to various locations and various classes of airspace and, uh, and promulgate those uh, with the FAA, they will ultimately promulgate them, not us. We'll test them. So that's the approach that I would see us taking. Elizabeth may have some other thoughts about that one. So, Ro, I, I would want to say that currently, um, as you know, the agency is authoring the small rule, and we plan to have that out um, by the end of the year. Um, that rule and the way it's structured right now is being held pretty tightly in the agency. NASA would probably be delving in further right now on that type of environment. Chuck? Uh, thanks. I don't have anything else to add because I, I think I didn't quite hear uh, the last part of uh, your comment. Um, so uh, so I'll, I, I think I'll just wait for the next question. Fair enough. And uh, while I've got you, Chuck, uh, how about I, I go over to you? Uh, Rakesh is asking, uh, with increase in number of UAS in future as expected, how do we take care of security and integrity of existing helicopters, low-flying vehicles already in use? So, um, so thanks, thanks for the question, Rakesh. I, that that does go back to some of the things that we're looking at um, for farther-term research activities, such as the UTM work that I uh, mentioned that. Uh, that uh, Dr. Uh, Koperdeker is looking at out of Ames um, is that we really want to look at how um, aircraft uh, at the lower altitudes interoperate with those aircraft that currently use that kind of an airspace. And, and uh, uh, you know, overall, we, we look at 
um, how um, how we move forward is going to also include not just the research that we do at at NASA, but how we work that with the rest of the community, and that's where I see um, the test sites being uh, offering an opportunity um, that we don't have uh, necessarily at NASA. We do have uh, operations we can t conduct in restricted airspace, but uh, the the uh, the um, the standing up of the test sites uh, presents a, another opportunity for us at NASA to work with um, t test ranges to be able to come up with uh, how you might test uh, a system for uh, small U.S. and how you might do the traffic management for it, and and I think that there are some opportunities there um, for us to look at that. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, I've got a question here for you, John, uh, who is asking, what is being tested at the test sites? That's actually a very good question because uh, I, I think that you can say that there are, uh, you can answer that on a couple of levels. First of all, uh, I would say that we are in a uh, crawl, walk, run kind of approach, so we're starting off uh, with small UAS uh, at low altitudes, at slow speeds, and short distances uh, to really manage our risk and, and, and get our processes and procedures down so that we can do this responsibly. Uh, but what we are actually going to be testing is, is going to be a couple of different things. First of all, I expect we're going to have uh, some uh, UAS uh, developers providing systems to us that they will want to uh, uh, demonstrate and hopefully at some point we will uh, provide them a, a pathway uh, to provide the test uh, data that will allow them to certify those vehicles. Um, I think we're going to be integrating some systems uh, into uh, existing UAS to test those out in, in, in flight operations. Um, and one of the things that, that uh, we've seen is some interest in uh, using UAS as surrogates for satellites. Uh, so you'd be flying a, a sensor that you expect to put on a satellite, but you fly it in a small U.S. to start with, just to verify it will it will work before, rather than using a, an expensive launch. And the third thing is we, we see a number of uh, users and operators that are very interested in demonstrating uh, the ability of UAS to do things. For example, utility uh, companies are, are interested in, in, in looking at how UAS may be used for pipeline inspection or, or power line inspection. So uh, that's what we expect to be doing over the, over the short run. Uh, we, we certainly are, are hoping that we get some direct uh, tasking from uh, the FAA to, to work on specific issues that they're, they're looking for. But uh, Elizabeth mentioned that uh, at present they're, uh, they're, they're cash strapped. So what we're trying to do is uh, develop the data that we can out of the test program that we have funded. Okay, and I think this one is uh, actually going to be our last question for today. What about safety for, for people and assets on the ground? Uh, for example, if a UAS loses power or fails in another way and can't stay in the air, uh, to make it come down gracefully? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, you know, it's clearly uh, part of, of the FAA uh, safety work to look at at the uh, the implications of safety to persons and property on the ground, and and in a lot of cases, um, I think some in the U.S. community think that since there's not a pilot on board, there's really not that much of a safety implication, but there is. So uh, so you have to look at ways to and and NASA has spent a lot of uh, time and effort on the space side, looking at how you might be able to autonomously land a, a vehicle in the ideal location, in the optimal location. Um, and so some of that technology at, at NASA can be applied in this case where maybe you find ways to have uh, vehicles if they lose power or if they somehow uh, lose capability uh, to be able to land uh, somewhere where it's the safest. And in, in the case of manned aircraft, you've got um, a pilot that might be uh, looking down and so they can avoid the, the schoolyard. Um, when they, if they're going to have to put the airplane down, same thing can be done um, through through autonomy with unmanned aircraft. And I think that's that's a broad area of research that we um, we can move forward with. And I, I think that uh, there's an opportunity there to 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 team again with the test sites to look at some of that. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And I say we're just about at that time. And folks, before we sign off. I would like to thank each of you for joining us and trust that you found today's 
session to be of value. Special thanks to Chuck Johnson, Elizabeth Soltis, John Green, and Roe Bailey, and of course, our sponsor and co-host, Trimble and Inside GNSS. And uh, also, quick thanks to our behind-the-scenes uh, producer, Patty Van Hooser, for all the support. Thank you all for joining us. This is Lori Dearman saying have a great rest of the week.